Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for October the 20th of 2020. Of course, my name is Samuel Adams and this is a daily gaming news podcast meant to bring you the hottest news you need to know from around the industry. Hosted on YouTube and podcast services around the world five days a week, it is your one-stop shop for everything you need to know. So if you enjoy the show and you like what you see, hit that subscribe button and keep coming back for more. But today we are actually going to be talking about a story that came out a few days ago, but I wanted to give it the attention it deserves. Microsoft may yet end up shipping Halo Infinite's campaign and multiplayer separately. Halo Infinite, which was supposed to be Microsoft's big first-party launch game for the Xbox Series X, ended up getting delayed, leaving Microsoft's lineup this November devoid of new first-party games. Reports about the state of development that led to that decision in the first place are plentiful, but Microsoft itself suggested that it had considered splitting campaign and multiplayer in order to make launch. According to Xbox chief Phil Spencer, things may end up going that way still. In a wide-ranging interview with Kotaku, Spencer revealed that the decision of which part of Halo Infinite would be released, or whether a staggered release is even on the cards, is entirely up to developer 343. Quote Bonnie Ross, head of the Halo franchise, and the team will go drive those decisions, Spencer said, when asked whether Microsoft had considered releasing Halo Infinite's campaign and multiplayer separately. But I think we want to make sure people feel like they have a Halo experience. I think we can look at options like that. So yeah, I think it's something to think about, but we want to make sure we do it right. He added, pointing out that the way the game story is structured needs to also be considered before a decision like that is made. As part of the same interview, Spencer weighed in on the possibility of more Xbox games coming to Switch and shared his confidence that the $7.5 billion purchase of ZeniMax can be recouped without having to make Bethesda's games available on other platforms. And of course, we talked more about that last point in depth on yesterday's episode of the show. So, would they release Halo Infinite in chunks? It's entirely up to 343, but it very well could end up being that way. I have faith that 343 does not want it to go that route, because being able to have one comprehensive experience is certainly going to be a much more welcome reception from the community, because of the delay, quite frankly. Since there has been a delay, there's a higher level of expectation for Halo Infinite, and so to see that a campaign comes out next November, for instance, and then the multiplayer follows two to three months later, it wouldn't be a horrible move, but it certainly wouldn't be the same uh, jubilation from the Halo community, for lack of a better term. Uh, If it is the best route for the developers and for the game, then it is nice to know they would at least consider it, uh, because at the end of the day, we just want a very good Halo game. And this is really one of the last chances that Halo has in the hands of 343, or I really should say that 343 has with the Halo IP, because the last few games they put out have not been crowd pleasers. Uh, Personally, I was a big fan of Halo 4, still am, can't wait to dive in on PC. Halo 5 didn't really grab me. Uh, And so going forward, Halo Infinite really needs to be that rebirth. It needs to be that resurgence of the classic iconic Halo that we all know and love for it to really make the impact that it needs. And you can tell that this entire console launch was completely built around Halo Infinite. And they've largely shifted that to Xbox Game Pass as being the big factor that they point out whenever they're trying to sell an Xbox Series X. Uh, But if you look at the packaging, if you look at the uh, marketing materials, it is all Halo-centric. And they really were betting this game was going to come out this holiday season. Uh, But unfortunately, COVID changed things, and the development overall, I believe, has been pretty rocky, as we have seen uh, in many reports. But it could very well come down to Halo Infinite shipping in two different parts. However, that has not been confirmed, and again, that is entirely up to the team at 343. But you could be playing Halo Infinite on your iPhone with Remote Play because of the new Remote Play app that is out now with the Xbox app. While Microsoft is still apparently working on cloud gaming support for iOS, it just updated the iOS Xbox app with its new interface, as well as the ability to stream games from a local console. Since games stream within your house don't break Apple's App Store rules, it is a lot easier to make that work and should let you knock out a few levels when you want to play in a room that has Wi-Fi but is not close to your Xbox One or future Xbox Series X or S. Sony added Remote Play on iOS for the PS4 last year and already updated its app to work with the PS5 once that's available next month. For PC users, Valve's Steam Link app brought Remote Play around the same time. 
The updated Xbox app is also able to help users easily set up a new console, a feature many of you will probably appreciate in a little less than a month. A similar update for Android arrived last month and on Xbox One consoles last week, so everyone with the latest software should have things synced up immediately. Very cool, of course, I want to make this very clear, this is not the solution for the cloud gaming problem that we have been seeing over the course of the past few months. This is a very different situation. For the cloud gaming, that is essentially being able to play your Xbox Game Pass library from anywhere. So I could take my phone to work, I could take my phone to the park, I could take my phone to the beach. It doesn't matter where I am, I will have access to those titles. This is essentially the remote play that we've been seeing on the PlayStation 4 that was on the Vita uh, that then came to iOS devices. Of course, it's available in many other locations. It's also on PC on the PlayStation side of things. Uh, and so that is essentially what this is. I think this is something that was kind of cobbled together very quickly to please the iOS fans in the meantime while cloud gaming is being worked on uh, within the Apple ecosystem, but I really don't think uh, that it will come. Of course, Microsoft is very focused on trying to get cloud gaming on iOS, but it just does not seem like it's coming to be. However, the Xbox app is going to be playing a very big part in the upcoming console generation because the share feature was essentially built with phones in mind because it makes more sense to share a screenshot to Twitter from your phone than it does directly from your console. So that's going to be part of the experience. On top of that, the interface across all devices looks very, very similar. Uh, if you check out the Xbox Game Pass app on PC, it really does capture that Xbox design and that Microsoft UI feel that makes everything feel like one inclusive experience and it makes it a very good experience at that. So if you do want to download uh, the new Xbox app, it is out now on Android and iOS, and you can now remote play, which essentially means you can stream your Xbox over Wi-Fi from anywhere in your home. Now, moving on to more Microsoft news, Microsoft has been tapped to power the CES 2021 digital experience. Microsoft Azure Teams and Power Platform will all have a part in CES 2021. Now, this, of course, is not a gaming-centric piece of news, more of a tech piece, but one that I thought was still significant because CES still happens and it still is pretty big uh, for the world of gaming as well. Microsoft and the Consumer Technology Association announced today that Microsoft is the official technology partner for the upcoming CES 2021. Microsoft Tools and Services will be used to power the annual trade show's first all-digital event. Quote, it is an extreme honor for Microsoft to be selected as CTA's technology partner for CES, the world's most influential technology event, Microsoft said in a blog post announcing the partnership. It won't surprise you to hear we're bringing Microsoft Cloud Solutions, including Azure, Teams, and Power Platform, together with partner solutions to create the technology platform for the all-digital event that will bring together the entire global tech community and be the CES 2021 experience. Microsoft is leaning on its experience, shifting several events to an all-digital format this year as a bonus for powering CES 2021. Beyond its own flagship events like Microsoft Build, Microsoft has also collaborated with the NBA and the NFL to derive new digital experiences based on its tech. Microsoft helped the NBA, for example, digitally bring fans courtside for games this year. We now tailor our content to that format and we have transformed from a live show production team to a 24-7 television production network, complete with live anchors from around the world, Microsoft said. This new direction required collaboration, hard work, and a lot of humility. It's the experience that Microsoft plans to bring to CES. The trade show, which is the biggest of the year in the technology space, is set to kick off the week of January 11th, 2021. Because this is CES's first digital event, it is unclear what to expect, but we'll continue to get more details in the coming months. Here's my thing about digital events. And of course, CES is one that isn't gaming-centric, but it still is significant in the technology space, and I know a lot of you care about technology, because you're watching a technology and gaming podcast. But with COVID coming in, it's changed the way that we see live events. Of course, E3 was a big one that just did not happen this year. And you have so many other ones. TwitchCon comes to mind. On top of that, uh, you have uh, Gamescom in Germany. There are so many events that normally take place over the summer that just did not exist in their same way. Nothing can replace a physical in-person event. It is impossible to replicate that. It's the same way that a one-on-one -on -one face to face conversation over teams is completely different than a one to one face conversation in person. You can't read body language. You can't make that face to face 
eye connection. I don't know. It's weird to say, but it's just different. And in the same way, these digital events have been very different. They haven't necessarily been bad, but they have been different. And so hopefully CES is going to take everything that has been learned throughout 2020 with these digital events and combine all of that knowledge together to create something that is very memorable and very cool. Uh, if anybody can do it, it is Microsoft. Of course, they are a leader in the technology space. Very impressive to see what they're doing, even outside of gaming. Uh, they really are the foundation for businesses around the world. Uh, so we will see what comes of this when CES rolls around next year. Now back to the gaming stuff, 2K is under fire for adding unskippable in-game ads to the full price NBA 2K21 one month after release. As reported by Survivor, 2K recently added unskippable adverts into the full priced basketball sims pre-game loading screens across all platforms. The video below from Survivor shows an advert for Oculus Quest 2 attached to a pre-game video called My Team Season 2 Episode 7. The advert runs as the match is loading, you can see the loading progress at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. It is worth noting you cannot edit your team lineup until the advert has run its course. According to Survivor, the experience is the same on PC, even when running from an SSD. The adverts hit the game just over a month after launch on PC and current gen consoles, and ahead of the planned PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X release. 2K pulled a similar trick with last year's game, a move that was similarly criticized by fans. And it rekindles memories of EA's insertion of in-game adverts into UFC 4, a move the publisher eventually reversed following a backlash. 2K has a bad reputation for the monetization of its NBA franchise. In August 2019, European video game age rating organization Peggy said it was very aware NBA 2K20 got too close for comfort to teaching players gambling after it received a complaint about a controversial casino trailer. 2K had released a trailer for NBA 2K20 on YouTube that highlighted casino-style elements in the game, such as a slot machine minigame and a Wheel of Fortune minigame. Commenting on the insertion of in-game adverts into NBA 2K21, Redditor RiddleGaming21 said, quote, I truly don't know what to do or say anymore. A monopoly for a single genre of video games, basketball. Honestly, I don't even think there is a way to make me want to play anymore, and that truly upsets and disappoints me. This infuriated me earlier, added... Pandrew Bear 92. I saw an ad for Oculus come up and I was so dumbfounded I just sat there. It will be interesting to see how all of this works on the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, two consoles pitched as a more or less eradicating loading times. Eurogamer has asked 2K for comment. This is ridiculous. Completely and utterly ridiculous. If you are paying $70 for a game, you do not need to have advertisements in that game. More importantly, if they really want to make bank on this, then make a $20 version of NBA 2K and then put ads in that. I feel like that's the way to go. But if you're nickel and diming everybody and trying to get, you know, the current gen version and then you get the next gen upgrade that costs a little bit more and then on top of that you have these advertisements in there, it's going to turn people off eventually, as those Redditors were saying. But... The Redditors are the minority. A lot of people won't even blink an eye at this. And so, more than likely, the overwhelming majority of NBA 2K players are not really complaining about the fact that they get to watch an Oculus ad in the middle of their loading screen. Now, it would be cool to see them add some utility here if you could change up your roster. I don't know how NBA 2K works because I don't play it. Uh, but you can change up your roster, you can change your settings, whatever it might be. Something to do uh, while this ad plays. But even before we get there, just take the advertisement out. Uh, I don't mind stuff like... Uh, banners in the stadium. I don't mind stuff like the little boards that rotate at the bottom of the stands. Those are fine. Put ads all over that. Give me Burger King, McDonald's, whatever it might be. Uh, but to actually stop your gaming experience and to have an advertisement that you can clearly change out as time goes on, not a big fan of that one. And it seems like NBA 2K fans are not either. But to round out today's show, we do have a follow-up from yesterday's news that Rainbow Six Siege is joining Xbox Game Pass in October, specifically in just a few days on the 22nd. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege will join the Xbox Game Pass lineup on October 22nd, Microsoft announced on Monday. Players with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate will be able to play Rainbow Six Siege using cloud gaming on Android devices as well. Rainbow Six Siege is a widely popular multiplayer tactical shooter involving dozens of unique characters to play as. The game is more slow-paced and involves using destructible environments to help shape your win. The game usually retails for around $20, so now is a great time to try the game out if you've never gotten the chance to play before. 
EA Play games recently were added to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate's library, and big titles like Tales of Asperia and Age of Empires 3 continue to get added to the pass. Uh, quick pause, EA Play not quite included yet Polygon. I believe that these are coming later in the year. I believe December was the time frame that was given for that. Uh, so Xbox Game Pass Ultimate gives players access to both the PC and console Game Pass games as well. And of course the xCloud game streaming service for $14.99 a month, which is now, I believe, Xbox Game Pass game streaming, something like that. Uh, new subscribers will get their first month for $1, and the Xbox only version of the Game Pass costs $9.99 a month, while the PC version only costs $4.99 per month. I feel like that's also not correct. Xbox Game Pass PC price. Gotta make sure that's correct. Uh, yep, first month for a dollar, then $9.99. Alright, gotta unload a little bit. Julia Lee at Polygon. We we have to talk. Okay, first and foremost, the prices are incorrect for this. I believe the Game Pass on console is $9.99 a month. The PC version is going up to $9.99 a month. Should probably correct that. On top of that, EA Play not added yet. Just throwing that out there. Gotta make sure your reporting is on point because people depend on this. If I didn't know, like, you guys wouldn't know. Then you have these, uh, man. Anyway, Rainbow Six Siege coming to Xbox Game Pass. Very cool. Awesome to see. And uh, a big ad, I think, because Rainbow Six Siege is getting that next-gen upgrade. Of course, it is getting added ahead of the Xbox Series X, which it is going to play in 4K, 120 FPS. It's going to look phenomenal on the next-gen console. So this really is one that could be a seller for somebody on the Xbox Series X, because if they're right on the fence of getting a PS5 or a Series X and they look... And with Game Pass Ultimate, they get access to Rainbow Six Siege, and they are able to play it on their next gen with tons of enhancements. This could be one that says, hey, you know, why not? Let's go ahead and give it a shot. I can try out all these other games as well, and boom, somebody is into the ecosystem. Uh, so to continue adding these really big games to Game Pass is certainly gaining a lot of traction and a lot of fandom within the gaming space. But that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. If you enjoyed today's show, drop me a like down below and let me know what you think about everything we talked about here today. But specifically, how do you feel about Halo Infinite potentially shipping in two different portions, the campaign and the multiplayer? Would love to hear what you have to say. But until tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic rest of your night. I'll talk to you soon and peace.